Good day to everyone logged in right now. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are very excited to kick off Woven Networks Sharing Sessions, a global gathering for change makers. This is going to be a four-day webinar series of knowledge sharing, experiences with craft communities and forest research ma resource, sorry, management. We will be hearing from our craft change makers about their new discoveries and how they connect with our local and international partners to assess and provide solutions to the challenges that artisans and forest preservers face. More on the Scoping Grant Awardees later. Every day for the next three days, we will have different themes and topics to tackle all of them relevant towards both fashion, fabric, and the loop it creates with our forests. Today is discovery featuring innovative and sustainable ways to create with natural resources. Tomorrow, we rediscover the uniqueness of our weaving traditions and the cultures that they contextualize. On day three, we will listen to the speakers as they introduce new practices and frameworks for the future of weaving and the forest. And on the last day, that's session four on your screen, we will culminate with the launch of a virtual exhibition called From Land to Loom, From Fiber to Form, Woven Networks Research Projects. Participants who are able to complete the four-day event will get free online shopping credits. So be sure to attend all four sessions. We will announce the winners on September 2nd on the culminating day. My name is Kay Batikin and I manage Holy Cow PH. I will be your host for the next four days of inspiration and learning. This event is organized by the British Council in the Philippines in partnership with the Forest Foundation and supported by the National Museum of the Philippines. Now let's have a quick audience check-in. Before we get started, let's take a moment to check in and start an active engagement through a quick poll. If you could be part of a forest, what would you be? Would you be a tree, tall, strong, definitive of the forest? Would you be a river gushing and flowing, bringing life and form to the land? Would you be a bird or a butterfly crafting nests from materials around them, scattering seeds and pollen in flight? Would you be the soil? Rich, firm, reliable, and generous with providing what the ecosystem needs. What do you feel you are? All right. I'm seeing a lot of movement here. Okay. A lot of you feel like you are a river able to move and terraform the land. And that's, that's a wonderful thing, actually. Rivers are very important parts of the forest. And we will hear about it later on from our speakers. This is very, very interesting. Feel free to comment on the chat box as our talks begin um, and share your thoughts, share your comments for when we can air them later in the panel discussion. All right, so let's go over a few house rules. Number one, make sure your mic remains muted and your camera off during the program. A slash sign should show up in the icons on the lower left-hand side of your Zoom screen. Second, the session will be video recorded. By attending this activity, you consent to having your image and comments recorded and posted on social media. Three, at the end of this session, we invite everyone to participate. You may ask questions by typing them in the chat box. Our staff will be there to catch them. Also, join in the conversation by answering the polls that will pop up on your screen. And I assure you there will be so many interesting topics that will be tackled today, and I'm sure you will have a lot to comment on. Lastly, let's keep an open mind while being respectful to the rest of the participants. All right? so. 
without further ado, welcome every day, everyone rather, to day one, discovery, artisans and sustainable practices. Frank Herbert of Dune fame once said that the first step in creating a better future is to imagine it. We'll take this further today as we work towards our imagined futures with collaborators and fellow dreamers who are unafraid to put their hands in the sand. Now, to tell us more about how Woven Networks is helping to create a better future, let's hear it from the country director of British Council Philippines, Ms. Lotus Postrado. Good afternoon, ma'am. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I'm Lotus Postrado. I'm the country director of the British Council in the Philippines. Good afternoon, good morning to our um, participants from the UK. I'm really so excited to be joining you all at this event, the North, uh, the Woven Networks Sharing Sessions, a global gathering for change makers. Welcome to all our designers, our foresters, researchers, and artisans who are joining us far, far and wide across the Philippines, the UK, and beyond. And welcome to all, our, to all our partners as well at the Forest Foundation and the National Museum of the Philippines. British Council's work supports peace and prosperity by building connections, understanding and trust between people in the UK and countries worldwide. We work directly with individuals to help them gain the skills, confidence and connections to transform their lives and shape bet a better world in partnership with the UK. We support them to build networks and explore creative ideas, to learn English, to get a high quality education and to gain understanding and to gain internationally recognized qualifications. Each year we connect with thousands of policymakers, academics, artists and creative entrepreneurs. Our arts program strengthens engagement between the UK and the Philippines by supporting creative enterprise, innovation and inclusive growth. We bring artists and audiences together to share practices and creative ideas. We enable organizations and artists to find new ways of connecting with and, and understanding each other through arts and culture. We tackle global challenges through arts and culture to create positive change. Climate change, uh, forest conservation, women, livelihood, livelihood sources, craft traditions, and international collaborations. All these work together to form a nucleus that gives meaning to the term craft change makers. The Philippines is one of the most disaster prone countries in the world, bounded by tectonic plates and sitting on the core of a typhoon belt. Time magazine has called the Philippines the most exposed country in the world to tropical storms. But let us not blame it all on natural uh, catastrophes. Let us all admit that the leading cause of the problem is man-made. Is man -made. A key, solution, a key solution to find the right balance with nature by protecting our, forest, our forests and plant resources. Our dynamic partnership with the Forest Foundation Philippines offers an integrated solution from helping women artisans to grow livelihood through creativity and innovation to the conservation of forest resources, we are ultimately making an impact on the climate. This initial phase of urban networks is to conduct scoping studies within the Forest Foundation's focal landscapes and understand the challenges of foreign dependent craft communities. At the same time, grantees and beneficiaries through various avenues have the opportunity to connect with foresters, artisans, and UK-based uh, counterparts. As cited in the 2019 uh, report that we commissioned, International exchange and cross-sectoral collaboration are key in solving complex problems. We are already seeing the numerous benefits to these international networks, such as access to additional or specific expertise, a window to new perspectives, and two new relationships that could lead to career development and long-term partnerships. We hope that the initial research stage has built a solid foundation for the next phase of the program, which will focus on implementing the recommendations that had been rendered by the grantees. 
We thank our partners, the Forest Foundation and the National Museum of the Philippines. I would also personally thank the British Council Arts team, Lai, An, Kit, An, Mean, and Apa. And of course, the our team, the team RDB for uh, as our events manager for making this happen. We are all we are grateful also to our curator, Ms. Tessa Guason, and we congratulate the grantees for all the hard work and dedication to their work. I very much look forward to learning in the next four days, and we hope to see you every day until Friday. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Lotus. Now, our partners from the Forest Foundation have been a very valuable resource in helping us to create this program. Join me in welcoming the Executive Director, Attorney Jose Andre Canivel, for his opening message. Good afternoon, Attorney. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you, Kay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. We are pleased to join you this afternoon. Uh, I'm speaking from our office here in the Forest Foundation, uh, but my uh, heart and my mind uh, goes out to all of you who are joining us from uh, parts of the Philippines and other parts of the globe. Um, the Forest Foundation is a grant-making uh, technical assistance foundation that aims to support uh, individuals, organizations, and institutions who seek to conserve and protect what remains of our forests in the Philippines. Um, our work, of course, is linked to lessening uh, the impacts of climate change. And as Lotu said, uh, the Philippines, uh, unfortunately, because of its geogra biogeographic context, falls within one of the most hazardous zones in the globe. Um, however, protecting forests, restoring forests, and managing what remains of them is an appropriate action. Uh, and is, uh, as many say, it's one of the easiest things to do to help our country um, mitigate the impacts of climate change, adapt to the impacts of climate change, uh, and at the same time do our share in terms of solving this global uh, problem. But of course, you know, that's easier said than done. Uh, as our experience uh, has shown us, um, protecting forests requires not just uh, resources, not just a firm commitment to uh, addressing uh, threats to forest degradation. It requires that communities, forest-dependent communities, forest users benefit from standing forests. It requires indigenous peoples to continue to live sustainably among forests. And it requires uh, projects such as ours to enable them to develop sustainable pathways so that they can continue to stay within forests use forest resources, but gain a sustainable living, an enterprise out of uh, staying, working, and being in forests. Woven Networks allows us this opportunity through the sharing networks, <clears throat> excuse, through the sharing sessions later, uh, in the and in the next few days, we'll be able to identify um, enabling conditions, the innovations that are necessary, as well as the skills and capacities that are needed so that our communities can continue to weave, can continue to use forest resources, while at the same time reaching new, new markets, while at the same time developing new skills while at the same time being parts of new networks. This project also allows us to develop a tapestry of support for all of our forest dependent community partners. Uh, we now have experts whom our community partners can rely on uh, for advice 
for technical assistance as well, and for guidance as they craft um, and as they weave uh, new products, new enterprises, um, and, and new pathways for their own sustainable development. This project also allows us to tap into new networks. So we're very thankful for uh, the partnership with the British Council, the partnership with the National Museum. Uh, we're also very thankful for the partnerships with the communities and the researchers slash mentors slash innovators that have been that has been going on uh, in the past months. We hope that this project continues to bring in other partners, including the DTI, perhaps local government units, and even the DNR, uh, so that together we can develop um, not just projects, but develop enterprises uh, that protect forests, that sustain lives, and that enable us in our ways to contribute to climate change mitigation and adaptation. The Forest Foundation uh, also has gone into this endeavor because we feel that we can support more communities in an appropriate manner through the woven uh, networks. In the next few months, we'll be developing the second phase, the third phase even perhaps, of supporting these community enterprises, um, these weaving uh, um, communities so that they can work within themselves and within their communities towards uh, improving their, their craft, but also towards uh, enhancing their livelihoods, their enterprises, uh, and ensuring their economic uh, sustainability. We look forward to working uh, with the British Council, with many of the research grantees today, and more importantly, with the communities uh, in the next, uh, uh, so that in the next few months, we can develop more appropriate, uh, but also more sustainable partnerships to support your work and ultimately to support forest conservation. Uh, Again, thank you very much for the opportunity to be part of this network and to support um, this work that weaves together um, culture, communities, and forests. Thank you. Thank you very much, attorney. Now, for everyone, I know you're all eager to start the discussion. Well then, let me introduce to you our moderator. A reader in material culture at the Royal College of Art in London, England, he specializes in ethnographic research focusing on materials making and manufacturing, especially relating to the production of luxury goods and artwork. He is currently the co-lead for the Material Engagements Research Cluster at the Royal College of Art and heads the International Thai Textiles Research Project. Let's welcome Mr. Peter Oakley. Hello, Peter. Thanks for being our moderator today. Thank you, Kay. Hello, everybody, and good morning from London. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to introduce an exciting set of speakers for today who will be sharing their insights on sustainable products and practices. A quick recap on the timetable. Each presentation will be 15 minutes long, starting with an overview from the Philippines lead of each of the research projects. They will share the highlights and findings from their study and what they may have planned for the future work with their community. This will be followed by a contribution from their respective collaborators who will share their experience of working with the researchers and give their perspective on the project and the Philippines craft communities. After the presentations, we will have a panel discussion to answer some questions. So could everyone please put your questions into the Q&A box as they occur to you during the presentations, 
so they are ready for that part of the session. So let's begin. First, we have Anna Samenta of Rurangan Sayatobo, excuse my English pronunciation, uh, foundation with their project titled Assessment of Palawan Source Non-Timber Project Forest Fibers for Contemporary Hand Weaving Application. Anna is a program development associate and has been with Rurigan Satobo Foundation for two years and aims to make Palawan made handwoven products accessible to more people. Anna will be joined by Liesel Bonifacto, a textile weaver from the foundation trained in handloom weaving. So let's welcome Anna and Liesel on screen. Hi, Peter. Thank you for that introduction. Um, Lizelle will be speaking first. I'll just share our presentation. And happen for a minute by show. Maganda <laughs> Dati, nung maliit pa ako, familiar ako sa mga halaman tulad ng pandan, ratan, dahil ginagamit ito sa pagawa ng mga baha. Hindi ko lubos maisip yung kahalaga nito sa ngayon. Na mas marami pa palang pwedeng pakinabangan ito. Ngayon, na medyo matagal na ako sa industriya, nakakilala na ako ng iba-ibang tao, komunidad at proseso, mas lumawak na rin sa kaalaman ko ang iba-ibang fiber na pwedeng maging livelihood, livelihood din sa iba-ibang community. Kung tutuusin, ngayon ko lang din nalaman na yung puto na ginagamit namin sa paghabi ng rurungan na galing sa ibang lugar sa Pilipinas, mayroon din pala dito sa Palawan, doon lang sa labas ng bahay ng mga kita ko. Dahil sa pananaliksik, tulad nito, mas lumawak pa ang kalaman namin sa kahalagahan ng mga halamang gubat at ang rason kung bakit kailangan itong protektahan. Thank you, Ate Lizelle. Thank <laughs> All right, so I'll be speaking about our project, which Peter introduced a while ago, which is entitled Assessment of Palawan Sourced Non-Timber Forest Fibers for Contemporary hand weaving Application. The study was conducted with the intention to create reference material on Palawan's available non-timber forest fibers, especially after Typhoon Odette hit the island in December 2021, as well as provide context on craft communities that may be used in the future formation of sustainable plans for craft development and material preservation. My co-writer Gloria Lim and I wanted to answer the question, what NTFP materials and processes currently available in Palawan are viable for the current market? And how can local, national, and international collaboration aid in regenerative innovation? We hope that in the future, by utilizing NTFP in responsible and informed design, their importance can be solidified and a holistic approach to its use in the production of market-ready contemporary products can be established in collaboration with the communities that they are sourced from. This will also enhance the value of their craft as being engaged in every step of the process and having a system where they are able to create products that involve different parts of the community can foster a sense of pride for their work. After a few weeks of coordination with government agencies, local government units, as well as artisans who are previously known to Rurungan through the Binhi sa Rurungan weekend markets, we were able to confirm participation of communities and businesses who would engage in open dialogue on their current situation, crafting practices, and difficulties they may face. These participants include Filfida registered fiber processors, indigenous communities or produ uh, producers, communities with raw materials, as well as registered artisan communities with craft businesses present in the following locations. 
So we were able to visit six municipalities and one city. And through these trips and conversations, we were able to collect data on the local names of 20 Rattan, two Nito, four Pandan, as well as two subclassifications of it, two types of banana, including the common abaca and a wild untested variety called saging ungoy, two bamboo and four palm. Additionally, we also verified the presence of tikog and pineapple plants within forest cover in Palawan. Among these plants, it was found that pandan and rattan were the most commonly available and used in Palawan. It is of note though that for many of the plants in our study, different varieties possess different characteristics, which contribute to the reason why they are chosen for specific applications. Take these tinkok baskets, for example. They are a one inch miniature version of the traditional tinkok, which is usually larger in size, ranging from one to four feet tall, and used in storing rice grains and seeds. To create finer weaves, a vine-like bamboo called binsag is used, which you can see on the left side. You can see how this type of bamboo looks like here. It's also on the left side. So it's a really, really small type of bamboo, which is more flexible, which allows them to use it for that application. The busnig and bodong varieties of nipa and rattan respectively, which you can see on the right side, are used for their aesthetic characteristics. In these two samples, no additional dye was used to create the different patterns. They were simply created by using different techniques. The, dif the darker colors were achieved by keeping the skins on, while the mid-tone shades were created by partially, partially scraping off the skin. The lightest shades are the same kind of plants, but they're harvested earlier. So these are just samples of some of the products that we found. Most of them are made with a mix with a mix of different plants, but most of them are still made out of rattan and pandan. Pandan, which is used in the mats you can see here, which are from the Jama Mapun weavers in Sofronia Española and in Brooksborn. So in this part, as we conducted our interviews, the communities identified the following as points for improvement. Skills improvement, like having workshop on techniques for skills refinement, as some of these may have gotten lost through different generations. Um, access to markets where local or foreign tourists frequent to increase sales and awareness of the craft. And access to materials, which has also been stated as a concern, mostly regarding indigenous communities like the Tagbanua, Palauan and Tawat Bato, who are in our study, who do not cultivate the plants that they use, but instead sustainably source these materials from the forest. The other points for improvement that we identified can be access to external resources or intermediaries who can help with communities' marketing strategies and also assist them with permits and fees regarding sourcing materials. So now I'm going to talk about the future development pro uh, for future development projects. We suggest that the communities go through a three-part cycle, categorizing the diagram as market, reflect, and development. In market, communities should be exposed to marketplaces or similar situations where they are exposed to others with similar crafts. This can be done with the help of intermediaries that can endorse and sponsor local artisans to join said events. This will enable them to compare and contrast their own craft with others to be able to see what sets their work apart from others. Important factors to compare are in quality, price, and design. During the reflect section, external resource groups can give assistance through conducting workshops on points focused on during their market expo exposure, sorry, to identify what makes them unique from other craft communities, work on their branding because their unique background influences their design, and assess marketing strategies to connect their product design with the market. The last stage of the cycle is in development, wherein assistance can come in to address the identified internal and external factors hindering the growth of craft communities. As this cycle is repeated, communities should be able to transition from receiving assistance 
in all sections to reduce this need for assistance incrementally with the goal of being able to execute this system on their own. So for the next steps on Rurungan's part, we are able to provide seasonal physical market space at our weekend markets. We can also be a partner for pro prototyping product development. And we can also be the first point of contact for communities for interested intermediaries. For others, further studies on plants identified can be done. Sponsorships for communities to join market spaces can also be given. And as said earlier, workshops on permits, business management, and marketing can also be done. All right, that's all for me. For inquiries, you can also email us or ask at the Q&A portion later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna and Liesl. And just to remind people, if they have any questions or comments to put them in the Q&A now so they're ready for the session. That would be very helpful. I think there are some very interesting points that have come from the presentation. Uh, Lisa's comment that the same product is used in different contexts. So it's used for making objects as well as for construction. And the fact that plants are being, you know, plant materials are being imported when they are growing in the backyard is an amazing thing to think about in terms of helping communities be self-sustainable in terms of the way that they produce materials. So Anna's description of the plants that they identified, I think is very important work that underpins the development of new products. And the sensitivity that's being shown in terms of identifying different colors through very simple, but actually sophisticated processing techniques is also something that is a useful pointer for other projects, as well as something that could be capitalized on for this project further. A very interesting le uh, list of possible ways of going forward and things that the community needs. I'll be interested to see how much this is replicated by other projects. Um, I'm aware that the one I was involved in, there are some similar elements that come up. So um, as a very nice segue, uh, next we have Twinkle Ferraram with her project, Linking Landscapes to Cultural Creative Sustainability. Um, Twinkle is a fashion designer, textile developer, design innovator, business founder, community livelihood advocate and a business mentor. Her passion project, Style Isle, is a collection of objects made and curated in collaboration with indigenous and artisanal communities throughout the Philippines. So let's hear from Twinkle now. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning to everyone. So I'll be presenting my presentation. Um, RDV. Um, okay. So with uh, my research project, I decided to visit um, three different weaving communities. Um, one is in Luzon, and then one is in Visayas, and one is in Mindanao. So together with Dr. Peter Oakley and Rebecca Hoyes. Next slide. Uh, so from my point of view, um, the Philippines is rich in biodiversity and natural materials, yet when it comes to sustainable production, continuity, and bringing economically viable products to market, there are gaps that need to be addressed. So we have found weaving communities are often not familiar with the raw material production process. This can even be the case when historically production occurred locally and managed by the community. There are opportunities for stimulating local farming and harvesting that will create new jobs whilst also protecting the local environment, including forests, treescapes. Many products that are being produced are not differentiated enough, and many do not appeal to consumers with high purchasing power, example, tourists. There are also issues about consumers not being able to find these products. 
design interventions are therefore needed. More emphasis on localized production and the use of non-polluting materials, example, dyes from natural sources, rather than the industrial aniline dyes, will improve the local environment and ecology, as well as the health of the local population. Opportunities for networking and partnership development need to be made available. So next slide. Um, just to give an overview of the raw materials from the different communities for the Misamis Oriental, we visited the Abay Silk Weavers Association. And then for Leyte in Tolosa, we visited the Kapangihan Mothers Weavers Association. And its main um, raw material fiber is the Tico grass. And then in Sierra Madre with the Det Fawai, um, the Sabutan. So next slide. So these are some of the common things that we discovered in all three locations. So the sustainability of raw materials for weaving and then utilizing non-polluting raw materials and identifying possible extra benefits, developing new designs, patterns, and motifs inspired by the locality and culture, and building new links between different partners to facilitate more sustainable practice. So next slide. So for, for the first part, the sustainability of raw materials for weaving, for the Sierra Madre part, um, the Sabotan is actually very endemic. Um, another raw material that they also shuffle between is the bidio. So if they don't use the Sabotan, they also use the bidio. In, in Leyte, the Tico grass is actually an invasive type of grass. And what's nice about, is the, about this community is they actually um, organize themselves after the Yolanda typhoon, when they realized a lot of their other crops that they were tending to, like copra, was devastated with the typhoon. And they discovered that the Tico grass was the thing that was still there. So they decided to give it more importance and attention to. And now it's their main source of income. And for Misamis Oriental, we have the mulberry and the mangrove. Um, so for example, in one of the farms, one of the silk farms that we visited, they actually have a mix of mahogany trees, coconut, and mulberry. So utilizing the um, available space that they have. And one thing about the mulberry tree is it's an ideal plant for sustainable development due to its unique positive impact in the environmental safety approach. It relieves mother nature from ecological disturbances. Um, the other thing that we also discovered is when we visited a mangrove park near Misamis was that the parts of the plant can actually be used as fibers for weaving and dyeing. So next slide. Um, utilizing non-polluting raw materials and identifying possible extra benefits. So the common denominator we saw with the three uh, weaving communities was that a lot of the dyes being used are actually chemical aniline dyes. And there is not um, there's no practice where they get to dispose of the chemical waters after the dyes have been mixed. Um, so finding alternatives to aniline dyes and ways of disposing dye water waste in a healthy way for the people and the environment. Um, due to privacy reasons that I don't want to disclose, um, but there is one weaver that I met in uh, Leyte who actually just recovered from cancer. And um, we realized that one of the factors could be perhaps the environmental um, thing that she, condition that she's living in with the, with the dyes and the fibers that are just nearby her. Um, so connecting it to the sustainable development goals wherein good health and well-being, clean water and sanitation, and life on land with the forestry. One thing that, um, next slide. Yeah, so one of the recommendations we have is to actually um, re, 
rediscover and re-research the other traditional methods of how to create other colors. For example, um, in this middle photo, uh, the dark color was created by cooking the fiber. So it's creating other shades, um, creating a natural dye garden, which could be located near the weaving communities areas. Um, dye plants that can also provide food stuff or other products like ebony tree samples or likeness techniques and natural dye issue and solution explored as further research. So we actually tried dyeing some of the fibers, but it didn't work. So there is, well, this is just one example. Um, so incorporating natural dyeing and method, methods and healthier waste disposal and the possibility of creating a natural dye garden within each community's vicinity. So next slide. Yeah. So um, sharing here some of the products that we saw um, within the weaving community centers and also in the souvenir shops that was nearby. So we are proposing also for the development of new designs, pattern, patterns and motifs inspired by the locality and culture. So there is a need for producers to differentiate their products through design qualities, establishing their unique selling proposition. For example, you can see here that um, a lot of these are very or quite similar or they, they develop products that are um, suggested by others, but not really utilizing what their specialties are. Uh, so next slide. Yeah. Uh, for example, the Banig mats, which are normally plain or checkered, uh, which is converted into other products made by the Kapangihan Mothers Weavers Association. So you can see here that they do mostly um, mats, wallets, bags, and slippers. Um, one of the things that made them survive during the last few years was creating the plain woven mats, which became the base for the other weaving communities around Samar and Leyte to use as their base for the embroidery type of weaving. Um, so they also do pandan weaving, which is another fiber that's abundant in their area. And then next slide. For the silk part, um, if you notice, they've also been doing experimentation with tie dyeing. Um, and then the ones in the right side is um, designs and modifications by the Philippine Textile Research Institute located in Cagayan de Oro, where they've also been doing different developments in terms of creating new patterns and designs with the silk. And one thing that we saw on the right side is the traditional tinalak design but woven with silk yarn. So actually one of the opportunities that I also see here is that this community is one of the only weaving communities in Mindanao that does silk. So there is an opportunity to revive a lot of the traditional ancient textiles where they, they really did incorporate silk and cotton weaving. So um, the possibility of reviving those textiles is also there with this community. And then next slide. Yeah. Um, so these are some sample products of what's being woven in Samar and Leyte. If you notice their specialty is the Linara type of uh, technique wherein they do embroidery on the Banig base. So they do a lot of different modern designs. And if you see the patterns, they're mostly geometrical um, or inspired by nature. Or this one in the middle is actually inspired by a Yakan textile motif. So one thing that we noticed that was lacking was something that was that's more inspired by the history and culture of um, Leyte and Samar. Next slide. So for example, developing new designs and patterns, motifs inspired by lo their locality and culture. 
So the ones on the left is actually a design intervention um, that was done by DTI and a designer consultant. But for example, um, traditional Visayan tattoo designs could be used as a source of inspiration for creating more distinct patterns that could set these weavers apart from the other weavers. Um, Leite is also known for the Pintados Festival. So they are the tattooed warriors of the Visayas. So next slide. Um, building new links between different partners to facilitate more sustainable design, uh, sustainable practice. So access, ac assessing what gaps are and how to link the different developing platforms and conversations. So for example, with the Detfawai Weaving Center, um, they are actually, she is the chieftain of their community and they are located in their ancestral domain. Um, this location is actually uh, very near Balair and there's an opportunity to connect with Museo de Balair, which is a tourist destination, which is also a surf town. So there's this possible, possible link and opportunity for this community to expand their market to more um, tourist locations, like for example, in the hotels or the resorts for the visitors to also get a full view spectrum of what is located, you know, what, what the area is telling them all about. So next slide. Hello. Okay. Um, so yeah, these are just more photos of our visit in Leyte. So we visited the DTI showroom where all these um, different samples from the different weaving communities are made. Um, that's the farm where the, the Kapangihan Mothers Association actually gets their tico grass. There's also a mountain there, but um, it was too far to hike to where they get the tico grass as well. Um, so there's all these opportunities to connect to all these different tourist spots around the area. And, um, and the photo there in the upper right is also a souvenir area in one of the resorts in Leyte. So again, co-creating projects, dialogues, and connections between farmers, government agencies, artisan communities, private sector, and tourist destinations. So giving them access to market, showcasing pieces through digital platforms, distribution and display of goods in commercial areas or tourist areas, and um, the heritage and history of the Benig. So this was actually something I was trying to look for when I was in Leyte. I couldn't find any um, like museum that could tell the story of when and how the Benig was discovered or was being made in the, in the area. So I think that's something that can also be um, developed in the area as a point of uh, you know, history and culture as well. So next slide. Um, so yeah, this is um, the photos in Misamis Oriental in the visit in the Mulberry Farm and in PTRI and the Abai Weavers Multipurpose Cooperative where they do the silk weaving. And this is one of the tourist destinations we visited where it was a mangrove park and you can go boating. And that's when we learned that you could actually use the plant for dyeing and weaving as well. And mangroves are good because they help with the floods. Um, okay, next slide. Uh, so this is just a map of the locations that we visited in the past few months. Okay. So what's nice about Sierra Madre is it's known as the shield of the north, which is protecting the northern region from major typhoons. Samar and Leyte, which is more coastal, and it's prone to typhoons because of its geographical location. And Misamis Oriental, known for beaches, fertile mountains, and lush forest reserves. Next slide. All right. So in location one, um, 
these are just the fibers in that area, the Sabotan and Bideo. Uh, this is showing Mr. Marcelino, who is a Bantay Gubat forest ranger, how they do the harvesting of the fiber. So the community that we were in touch with is the Dimasalang Egongot Tribe Farmers and Weavers Association. So they create woven round mats, placemats, fans, hats, wallets, pouches, bags, laptop bags, slippers, and organizers. So the fibers are abundant in the area, but right now there is a current threat with settlers planting other types of crops in their land. So potentials and opportunities, there's an opportunity to create collaboration between the indigenous peoples of the land and the settlers. Amongst types of crops to be planted, crops that can be co-planted, collaborative meetings and projects between the indigenous communities, training of planting and harvesting the fibers for forest rangers and artisans, creating new potential source of income integrated into eco-volunteerism industry. Next slide. Um, so here I'm sharing one of the beautiful things that we got to see. So it was actually the first time that um, I also saw these. So these are some heirloom heritage pieces of the Egongot tribe as a source of design inspiration. So this is something that they can look to for creating their new products and pieces. Um, these are different embroidery motifs that are also seen in their traditional um, outfits. And on the left are the products that they create. Next slide. Um, Samar and Leite. So this is the Tico grass and pandan. So it's found in the wet, muddy parts of rice fields. Um, the weaving, farming, and forestry community community that we touched base with was the Kapangihan Mothers Weavers Association. So they're mostly mothers. And as I mentioned a while ago, they formed after the Yolanda uh, typhoon in 2013. So their main products are the Banig mats, plain and with some checker design, also converted into slippers, wallets, bags, and also used as the base for other weaving communities to use for Linara, which is the term for embroidered pandan fibers into the Banig. Sustainability assessment, the fibers are also abundant in the area. Potentials and opportunities, develop natural dyeing methods and creating new base patterns designs on the mat weaving to give, their, to give these women also a chance for higher value products for what they create. Next slide. And for Misamis Oriental, the silk, mulberry, and mangrove. So the silkworm farming, which is also being done in the PTRI Cagayan de Oro, um, the mulberry farm that we also visited, um, and the mangrove forest resort, which is all nearby. Okay, next slide. So raw materials and plant fibers in the area, we have silkworm, Mulberry trees, it's not endemic to the area, but several farms and farmer associations are planting these as a form of livelihood planted along other crops, mangrove, and the sotonghon grass. So the farming community we visited was the Women of Balubal Cagayan de Oro Resettlement and Socialized Housing Project for Home Homeowners Association and the Abai Weavers Multipurpose Co-op and PTRI. So their main products are cloth, scarves, Filipino barong. Sustainability assessment, there are currently about three farmlands and associations with mulberry as its plantation production. Upon learning that mulber planting mulberry has environmental advantages, this gives an inspiring opportunity to plant these alongside other plants. Mangroves also have the potential to be a source of natural dye and fibers for textiles. This is another aspect that can be explored further. There is a current mangrove plantation, which is also an ecotourism site. So opportunity to develop new fibers and natural dye source, as well as to develop forest landscapes with multi-purpose crops that are also beneficial to the environment. So to develop further, to further develop designs and textile patterns for the weaving communities, as well as to train and develop new weavers. So next slide. Um, so things in common that the raw materials 
are abundant in some areas and fully cultivated in some. In all three locations we visited, the weaving communities were using mostly the chemical dyes. Yet in all three, there's an opportunity to revisit and explore traditional natural methods of dye, dye, dyeing, reviving old techniques, and using existing plants in the area. And for the current pattern and motifs, they have the tendency to be copied amongst each other based on each other's culture motifs. So one thing that's nice for them is to develop their own patterns to make them distinct from the others. So intercommunity communication, collaboration, and dialogue is needed to connect and create. So again, access to market and the digital um, platform. So most of the pieces we saw were usually in their homes or in the showrooms or in autop centers. And sometimes they're just seen during special events and trade shows. So with the digital platform, there's an opportunity to keep sales sustainable by promoting through uh, digital platforms and taking pre-orders. Uh, next slide. Um, so this is just like an overview of um, the different sustainable development goals that each part would be um, addressing and the different partners that we would be working with for the different issues that we found. So next slide. Yeah. So there, that's just a summary of uh, the different communities that we visited. Thank you. Thank you very much, Twinkle. Um, I'm aware because of time, I will make just a couple of questions, uh, a couple of comments. And then if we move on to the contribution from Rebecca. Um, one of the things I think is very important to note is how such projects can support indigenous uh, flora and fauna so trees such as the black ebony tree um, or particularly mangroves which are an incredibly important resource for supporting the environment having those as used as products makes them more valuable to local communities which means that there's more investment in supporting their continued existence it's a one of those things that we really need to recognize that the communities need to benefit directly from these sort of projects rather than expecting these things to happen without actually local communities benefiting. So I think that's one of the really important things. And talking of the sustainable development goals, recognizing that from a national perspective and also from many of the uh, NGOs that are supporting such projects, identifying with the sustainable development goals is an important way of demonstrating how the projects meet the expectations, both of the uh, organisations, but also of their wider supporters. So I will now move on to uh, introduce a presentation by Rebecca Hoyes. Um, she's had the opportunity to work, work with both Anna and with Twinkle. She's a British designer based in the UK with extensive experience creating innovative textiles and currently an associate lecturer at Central St. Martins, the University of the Arts London. Um, since she can't be with us today, she sent us a pre-recorded video, um, which we're just going to present now. Thanks, Marianne, for inviting me to share uh, my thoughts um, on my involvement in the projects, uh, the Woven Network Scoping Grants. So I had the pleasure of working with Anna and Gloria of Rurangan Satu Bod Foundation on their project looking at non-timber products uh, in non-timber non forest products in Palawan and Twinkle Ferran and her project Linking Landscapes. Uh, understanding the challenges and opportunities for craft development in Samar and Leyte, Sierra Madre and Misamis Oriental. So a little background to myself, I'm a designer, materials researcher and an associate lecturer at Central St Martins, uh, which is part of the University of the Arts London. Uh, I teach on the textile course. So I have an uh, interest in sustainable materials and natural colour systems and in the development of contemporary product rooted in traditional craft skills. So really what was my role in the scoping grants? So for Ruringan, really, 
I was able to add an understanding of the UK and European markets for woven products, um, offer some insights into overseas trade shows and exhibitions, and um, maybe some insights into potential types of training that could be developed to support artisans to enter new markets. Um, with Twinkle, alongside Dr. Peter Oakley, um, I was able to offer insights into sustainable materials and natural color systems and really understand how these could be used to create new product. Uh, what did I learn about the art artisan communities and their landscapes? Um, both Twinkle and Rurangan collected amazing stories and interviewed artisans and producers. And so these stories were really helpful in helping me understand challenges and opportunities and more about the materials and fibres. Um, and both created a, collected amazing images um, that really allowed me to really understand the, the challenges um, faced. So uh, with Rurangal, I also learned a, an awful lot of quite specific local knowledge about the effects of mining and extreme weather patterns uh, from climate change, and also about the complexities of local politics um, and how this impacts on artisans, establishing craft businesses dependent on specific materials. Um, with Twinkle, I was really surprised by the diversity of materials from Samar and Leyte. Uh, but also of the heavy dependence on synthetic dyes in current product. And I was also surprised about the lack of um, product diversification. And actually this presents um, some great design opportunities. Um, with both groups, I really understood the, about the interconnection between forest and livelihood um, and the marginalization of craft practices. So I will bring this knowledge to my own work um, and I think that the, the process of collaborating and exchanging knowledge was hugely beneficial. Um, I've got lots of ideas for new, new products and I really hope to be able to support uh, these projects and other projects going forward. Um, and I think really I have a much better understanding of the connection between forest and craft and this real fragile balance between the protection of the forest and um, and and how we as how we impact on on, on its on its use um, uh, the really fragile ba balance between the development and the conservation um, and of the huge effect of climate change on these communities so um, thank you very much to both the British Council and the Forest Foundation for allowing these projects, these scoping grants to take place. Um, and I look forward to um, using my knowledge to inform projects in the future. So thank, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, some words from Rebecca, very interesting there. Our third presenter is Jan Vincent April, April of Life College with their project, Sustainable and Innovative Weaving Practices, Processes and Networks Among Women in the Western Coast of Aboyan Palawan. Jan is the school principal at Life Scott College in Puerto Princesa City. His role introduces, includes leading the Global Citizenship Class, a travel abroad program to Southeast Asia, New Zealand and Australia. He'll be joined by his collaborator from the UK, Judith van der Boom, who is course leader for the MA Regenerative Programs at Central St. Martins. Please welcome Jan and Judith. Thanks, Peter. Good morning there in London and uh, good afternoon to everyone here in the Philippines. I will be sharing first our video presentation. Bawat 
lai may mga magkaarot mo at it si kamen ano bag ano bayong tapos mga barutangan it bugas barutangan it buntun pero mga kababaihan namang i magkaarot mo at it mga karubatan yan mga kalalakihan yung magkaarot ni rang karubatan mga rong basket yai magkaarot ang it mga kalalakihan Barasan, buang, abuan, may pangdan. Basta natin sila mo na ipandan, pag-abot naman sa palay, ano, iglat na mo na ipandan. Kailangan ma-inot para madali matuog ipandan. Basta tuog na, kailangan naman na ma-ulayan. Pahalang kami is mag-ulay. Pero yat makaraan, may pinuldo it amon it mag-ulay makailangan kanya nga nakaon, maputiin para madali kumulay mas matibay ikulay hindi kanya magkabura Pago pagkatapos makulayan, pwede naman na nga buwaten e ano pandan, pwede naman na buwaten yung unoy irag namang buwaten tapos ano tulungan naman kanya pwede buwaten sa kanya pwede ko at yung inal daon kasi inal daon ni iwat mo at at yun ay ano hidas mas magkabalikan na Yan, ano nga ang pagwaton, may ano kanya, kalasi-kalasi na ba? May barasan, may bangkuang, may abuan, may pangdan. Basta napisi na mo na ipandan, pag-abot na mo na sa balay, ano, iblad na mo na ipandan. Kailangan mainit para madali matuog ipandan. Basta tuog na, uh, kailangan na mo na nga kulayan magpangalang kami it mga pangkulay. Pero yat nakaraan may tinuldo it amon it magkulay na kailangan kanya nga lakaon, paputiin para madali kumulay. Mas matibay ikulay hingga kanya magkabura. Bago pagkatapos makulayan pwede naman ang buwaten e ano pandan. Pwede naman ang buwaten yung unoy irag na mong buwaton. Tapos, ano, dolomon lamang kanya pwedeng buwaton. Hindi kanya pwedeng buwaton in al daon. Kasi, in al daon iibuat mo, ano, matsyon i ano, gidas. Tapos, magkabarik kanya. Oh, ayan, oo. namun nga hanap buhay sana dakal pa i maaruta namun maipalambus namun pa i mga magkaaruta namun it mga uway uh, pangarap ko sana nga karoon it 
training center si Tutina para magkaroon at pagpanuluan at mga uwa itindahan at mga ano nabot naman mga anak naman baw mga uwa nga bukun mangarap naman naga nga makatapos sira at adal nira pagkakausa baw kusog it pagtatabang tabang baya baya un pakikipag ungayan ito o tumong tao All right, uh, good day once again, and thank you for this opportunity that we can share our initial and preliminary findings from our scoping study on Tina Weaving Community. And this afternoon, I'll be focusing on three bottom lines, which are culture, ecology, and the live aspects of uh, the Tina Weaving Community. First, uh, land connects people and generations. Our discovery centers project study, I mean, our, our discovery study centers on the lives, the stories, and the weaving culture of an Aplan Tagbanua community in Sitio Tina, Barangay Colandanum, Abordan Palawan. The community is located 80 kilometers away from the Puerto Princesa city center, and it's directly in front of the West Philippine Sea. Now, weaving and crafting are central to the lives of this community. And it's made possible by the abundance of non-timber forest products, of which we are able to identify 13 kinds in Tina ancestral domain alone, including six varieties of pandan and 14 varieties of ratan. Tina can be short for Tinagong Paraiso or Hidden Paradise, owing to the dense forest and mountains, diverse flora and fauna, most of which are endemic in Palawan, and even natural scenic spots and sacred places. And weaving and crafting are skills that is already embedded among the community members. Now, these skills traverse across generations. Their products remember their culture and tradition. And while their weaven products serve functional purposes in the household in the past, today's access to better road and market networks internet connectivity can potentially transform the tradition of this community into a community-based sustainable weaving enterprise. However, building such an enterprise would mean that they should recognize communities as ecologies. And, and so forest protection and sustainable sourcing of non-timber forest products are already intricately woven in the TWC. For one, Tina is within Palawan's Environmentally Critical Area Networks, or ECAN's core and buffer zone, wherein the buffer zone uh, provides areas for cultivation and plantation of pandan and uh, natural resources are protected through Tina Ancestral Domain Sustainable Development and Protection Plan. And by practice, the Tagbanuas in Tina are already harvesting according to their need and they are also allowing the plants to regrow. In this sense, the, 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 the TWC has very high awareness of their role as guardians and protectors of the forests. Their cultural values, traditions, and rituals form the basis for the sustainable forest management practices which they are already doing and to which these values and stories could build agency in their work and bring potential to new product developments for the sustainable living enterprise. And as a way forward to the community-based sustainable living enterprise, we are recommending some of, uh, uh, some of the recommendations that we have come up with are core products development and in core products development, we are thinking of designs which vary for seasonal collections, such as houseware, hampers, basketries, and accessories, which can carry the design, the patterns, colors inspired by nature, culture, their values, and their stories. 
For one, culture provides the stories to tell in their products. Uh, they such, uh, have a rich oral stories such as Amaloy and Tandul, which most of us have not heard of. They have Tagbana scripts, dances and songs, which they can put into their design in order to create a cultural heritage marketing. And second, nature or permaculture also serves as inspiration to new product creation and material development for ecological heritage marketing. And also some of the things that we've thought about uh, uh, recommending in terms of building, I mean, uh, building market networks through and innovation and product development through partnership with experts such as Judith um, market through local artisans. Uh, we were uh, glad that they allowed us to have a visit with the community and weaving clusters for co-creation across the different uh, weaving in the western coast of Palawan. Port One will be an online identity for Karubwaten Itina, which uh, was given by one of the uh, members of the tribe, which is Jessimil Ongwad, and we're thankful for her to have come up with this name. Um, online identity and presence could really help in, in terms of promoting their products. And lastly, we are also looking into how this uh, woven products can connect through different schools, such as, for example, with us, like college, uh, through the use or through um, weaving learning toolkits, which uh, can be developed later on. So built across the three bottom lines, ecology, culture, and economy, we really have high hopes that this initial and preliminary findings from the TWC uh, would help them achieve some kind of self-sufficiency and assert their cultural identity and agency through building a community-based enterprise. So we wish to thank the British Council and the Forest Foundation of the Philippines for the support. And now I'm going to turn you over to Judith, who is our UK collaborator. Thanks, Jan. Uh, and everyone, thanks for having me here. Um, I'll squeeze in a short slideshow of five minutes in this, uh, in this next bit. So I will just jump over to my screen. Um, wait one second. There we are. I uh, hope everybody can see this. Um, I'm just making it a bit smaller. Um, first of all, um, thanks for um, having me over and thanks Jan for inviting me also to the project. Um, I just want to compactly uh, reflect, uh, share a kind of reflection on the learning collaboration uh, we've done with Jan, with the Life College, but also with the Tina Weaving community in Palawan. I was asked to give uh, two online workshops. Uh, they were both two hours. They were set online. And Jan and his team have been really great and also just literally translating and growing through these small steps uh, of kind of communicating and experimenting. And I will share some insights from that and how I went into that. Um, just a, a short uh, background on myself. So I come from design. Um, I'm the new course leader of a, a new master on regenerative design, and I'm doing my PhD on actually ecoliteracy. So how do we really tie in ecological knowledge uh, with the practice of uh, product and development? So I, my background is also product design and working a lot with the craft, different crafts than only weaving. And it's been really interesting to join Jan and the Life College and the Tina community to be on this project. Um, as a base of the workshop, we're really, for me, uh, based in the sense of symbiosis, understanding the land as a partnership and how we work and live with the land. Um, it's very easy with a question to jump into innovation and new markets to look at that uh, in a very practical way, what has been happening all over the world, of course, but it's also very easy to lose a sense of place or relatedness with place, especially also with the ecology. And I think especially for the Tina weaving community, the ecology is a vital resource or what was earlier said, it's a, a forest dependent community. 
Um, I planned the workshop in three parts, focused on knowledge, reflection and practice, and then with continuous moments of group sharing within that, within an online setting. So sometimes it was challenging with communication and online settings, but it was already beautiful to see what could happen in short time. I think it's very important to understand that the ecology is a living symbiosis that we are part of. It's an exchange towards kind of thriving of all life. And also our human cultures is based on the symbiosis and the Tina community is relying on a healthy ecological relation in this way. But it's also important to see that creative processes are forms of exchanges and symbiosis, and they can carry the story of a place, of a maker and of the material. Um, both the workshops um, I've been centering around the notion of restoration, uh, what is based on the words of Gary Gabnan, we cannot meaningfully proceed with restoration and connection without restoration, in other words, until we hear stories being told again or relationship with the land cannot evolve and grow, who will tell these stories? It's very important for the community to, and I think many others have spoken about it already today, is about how do we create a voice, but how can you create a voice that is set by the, by the location and that will carry the work? And that was a base for um, both the workshops. Um, the story of the land and the community are not always present in the product, and, but also not how we always partner with the land. Um, and in the design workshop, the first design workshop, we use different creative storytelling methods to bring daily stories and small practices that value them or bring them joy um, and speak about relatedness to life through the using and practice of using colors, storytelling, drawing, and then translating this into pattern making. And I gave them a PDF on how can they make these little steps so people could also take this home and experiment and really as communities start building the stories they value. Uh, but also learning how to make small steps. How do you turn words to drawings, and how do you do? How do you turn drawings to columns and to patterns? Patterns. In the second workshop, we focused more on land management, and we went through more a group discussion and a drawing of stories and land use. So we compared their customs and conversations with permaculture principles. What do they mean? What is permaculture? Uh, looking at notions of companion planting, the supporting of plants, and you can look at it in the ecological principle, but also in a, in a method or an analogy, like how can we be companion planting as a market, as communities together, and they shared stories of their cultures of harvesting and talking about how species can support each other. But I, for instance, also shared how I grow my plants and how they support each other. And there can be an interesting exchange of different cultural approaches on how do we harvest and how do we live with the land. And these are just some images of things they've been drawing and how we can translate, for instance, the notion of pandan or mountains. And there's been many different examples. So I don't have time to show all the different layers of uh, uh, drawings they have made and the possibilities that come from that. Um, so I made three points on what were the learnings and discoveries. And the first, of one, the first one is building frameworks and processes that support the thriving of nature cultures. The Yantok and Pandan materials connect the seasonal and ecological story with the Tina community and are really rooted in their cultural identity, but also their ecological symbiosis. In the community, there's a real depth of knowledge and uh, in how they handle material and the plants and the handicraft. Uh, but often in the wish for innovation, this symbiosis can get lost and the need for the market replaces the, the understanding uh, and the relation of the ecology. Markets are fragile and also very much subject to change. And that's, I think, often why we're in this situation that markets are changing, but e ecologies are even more fragile. And how can we bring that together? So one of the things here we talked about is how can we really bring an um, importance on eco-literate development by training and working with them, with the local community to learn how they harvest, how they can build harvesting around their communities, but also mature their markets, but with the forest as a kind of partner. Um, the second one is how can we step up and build more local leadership? Um, innovation for me doesn't happen in really big ideas, but that community understands how small and simple actions can become impactful. And these small actions are present in how communities live and develop, how land is farmed and how generations are growing up. Uh, these basic steps could be worked more into workshops and building like local leadership and distributing kind of 
uh, a common ownership in also in how creativity is stirred, but also how markets are built um, and connect more networks together. I think for the participants, it was quite a new experience to share and draw, but in the workshop, they opened up and there was also laughter and a bit of discomfort. And it, it was nice to also as a workshop leader, then show a more vulnerable open side in sharing why it is important to brainstorm together and how we experiment together, but also how everybody can equip each other in taking that leadership. Um, oh, sorry, I went to the wrong direction. Um, and how restoring in the cultural identity is important in how we um, develop products and material developments. I think when we look in all our cultures, the stories of our origins are different in how we look at the world and nature, uh, especially I think in the visions of different indigenous communities, there's a real um, way of how we create re reality. And the Tina Weaver community has a depth of skills in making and taking care of the land. And their stories of kind of the mountain life and harvesting could be much more central in the stories that the products and the markets will carry on. So how do we translate the value of this symbiosis between the community and the land? And there could be different ways of doing that through workshops and uh, uh, equipping each other. Um, so yeah, in general, I think when we look at the, the community, I think they really embody a way of living and a history of maintaining the land. And there's a great value in further learning how to do more mindful planning and govern ecological and economic growth together. Also connecting more with other communities, what some of the other presenters have also said. I think there's a real strength, especially what I see today in all the different people creating research, but connecting them together, really making a shift in how we support markets. So learning from each other, but also much stronger sense of co-creation with the people and the communities and not seeing each other as competition, but really as a kind of uh, empowerment of uh, the group. So thanks again, Jan, for taking me on here and also for having me here today to share this uh, small uh, part. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jen, and thank you, Judith. Um, I, if we could move now to the panel um, just to answer the questions. I'm aware that we've the presentations have been slightly longer and therefore the panel is going to be very short. Um, but we do have a couple of Q&A questions that have come in that I would like to uh, the panel to address. So um, if if the panelists could all switch on their cameras um, or the presenters. And just as a quick note for uh, Rurangam, we have Gloria Sim who will answer the questions on behalf of Anna Samenta. And uh, so hello to Gloria. Uh, um, have we got everybody up on screen okay um the first question that um came up very early in the session um and i i will paraphrase this because it is quite a long question um but it's really about the balance between the communities and the designers creating projects. So how do you have an equitable balance rather than the designers being the name and the front of the program and then all of the work being done by the craftspeople that you don't really get to see or hear? I think uh, Judith has noted, uh, spoken to this slightly already, but um, does anybody have any particular comments or uh, advice for others? or even a perspective that they try and have for this. Um, so if if people can jump in as soon as they feel that they've got some comment to make. Um, maybe uh, we can get, I can give a little bit of a background also um, on your Lungan side uh, for this one. Um, as Anna said earlier, I don't know if you were able to highlight it as much, but um, in the cycle that we proposed, um, market reflect and development, um, it's actually creating um, that product development cycle uh, within the community. Um, so it's a cycle because this um, product development reflecting market access that is continuously changing with the times. And um, starting out that, that, um, that cycle from far off areas, um, like to quote some of the communities, um, Norlito and Godlito, who are um, IPMRs in Rizal, um, in a MLM, which is a protected area, 
um, they do want to have direct access to the market and design on their own, but they're a little bit, um, they don't understand the market or they've never actually had um, direct exposure. Some of them, some of the samples that they make for like, one example would be like um, when they would design for a cell phone, the cell phone that they designed for was actually a Nokia phone, um, which has not been in the market for years. Um, so it's really um, aiding them um, and assisting them through the first cycles of it. Um, and as Anna said earlier, um, hopefully as they go through the cycle, they would need less and less aid um, as to establish their own visual storytelling narrative and understanding of um, their own, uh, creating their own branding and ecosystem within themselves. Um, so the intervention with designers and collaborators, um, hopefully sustainable, but um, most likely will be temporary. So it's just giving them the aid in the start so that they will have access to um, another question that they had is like going into the niche markets. Um, that takes a lot of time and connection. So that aid um, from the designers, the collaborators and the intermediary would be giving them the much needed leg up to get to the point where they themselves will be um, part of the table, part of the market and, um, and they'll have access to it. Uh, so yeah, that's from- Thank, thank you, Gloria. Thank you. Um, does anybody else have any other comments that they want to add? Uh, Please, Twinkle. Yeah. Hi. Yes, I, I think I answered it in the question and answer part, but um, it's exactly why um, I decided to create another brand name, which is Style Isle. And it's actually, it's actually the style of the islands, because it was something that I um, discovered when I was just doing this out of, you know, passion. I wanted to know about more about my heritage, more about my country. So when I started meeting the different communities, I realized that they all have their own stories to tell. And I didn't, I, I, I am a fashion designer, but that's why I didn't want to put their stuff under my name because I felt that it had to be more about them. And so that's how we, um, that's how uh, it happened. So every time, it, like when I used to have a showroom, that's where I would put their products and kind of introduce it to the market as well. So just like what Gloria mentioned there, um, we actually also give advice, like business tips and ideas. For example, there are many things that they don't get to factor in, like cost of travel, cost of renting a booth, cost of operations, um, hiring a sales girl. Um, there are all these factors that uh, we, we, we take care of. So that's why um, the pricing is different. But we're very transparent with the communities we work with. So we do tell them that, hey, you know, your products actually... Um, you know, this is uh, what the market likes. This is the feedback that we got. The, these are the kinds of things people are looking for. And then um, because sometimes these communities, they end up getting to show in trade fairs, but they are subsidized. So they also don't know or realize the actual cost involved in, you know, in being part of a show or, you know, stuff like that. So there are... <laughs> Um, many factors to consider and to do. And those are the things that we do on the backside, uh, you know, the, the, the internal workshops, the feedbacks, the training, and then on the uh, public side, as much, you know, and every opportunity that we get, we, we tell their stories, we tell what, what it's all about. And that's why in the presentation I shared a while ago, it's really so important for them to have their own distinct style, which is um, that which they can get as inspiration from their own history and heritage, which a lot of them are also not any more familiar with, or it's because it's their grandmother who knows the story, or it's the grandmother who knows how to do this natural dye, but it's being forgotten because sometimes with design, with certain design interventions, those things are not uh, factored in. Like sometimes it's the designer that just puts in their thing without considering what they already have. So uh, for me, that's what's more important. And yeah, like what Judith mentioned a while ago, how it doesn't have to be about competition because everybody has the opportunity to really um, showcase their own amazingness. Thank you, Twinkle. Um, Judith, yes. 
Yeah, just thanks, Twinkle, for what you're mentioning, because I, I agree with that. I think it's also this sense we naturally look quite in a polarization mode, like, oh, yeah, the maker versus the designer, as if one is better than the other. But I think it's just about this understanding that we all bring different skills to the table, what you're saying, Twinkle. So, and we all have a role to play, but this is also a bit shifting the designer towards more a stewarding role, not going to the ego of design, like, oh, that person goes to the stage and put the work on front. But if you look more at design in this way, in a way of we want to thrive, we want to support the thriving of all of the communities in the ecology. It asks for a more like a supporting role, and but also protecting them for things, but also educating them. So you have the access to a market in a different way than the weaver that is harvesting and and working with the material. And I think you can. It's I think it's good with the community to talk about these different voices and what the impacts are of the different voices. Like, oh, if you go this, it might mean this for your community. So sometimes um, I think with also the Tina community, when you hear them talk about, oh, we run roads and markets and buildings, well, it might mean that your forest disappears. So it's good to, to look at that balance of uh, how do we progress, but uh, with the ecology intact. And uh, so progress, well, how we know it in society can be quite devastating. And um, uh, yeah. So I think really looking at small solutions and, and just as a designer being there as a kind of stewarding and informing them, I think that's very helpful. But I think you mentioned a lot of these things. So thanks. Yeah, thank you, Judith. Um, Jan, do you have an added comment or? Uh... I, I think uh, Judith has said everything about uh, what can be said, but uh, the, the difference is that as for, for, our, for my group, we're coming in as an educational academic institution who's interested to tell the story of the weavers. And uh, I think we, uh, you pretty much uh, seen from our presentation that uh, everything's really preliminary and initial. And what, really we, what we really wanted is that their story would come in uh, at, at the fore of, of uh, the the project. So I, I think uh, for us, we are also cautious, cautious about our role as a guide on the side rather than the sage on the stage. And I think this would be crucial in, in uh, determining the different functions or roles as, for example, designers coming in and uh, having their design uh, dominating the, 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 the culture or the, the community. But then it's for our part, it, it's, it's different. We wanted to start where uh, the community is and we want to take it forward from there. So I'm really glad that Judith was able to uh, just pin that down for our team. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you to everybody. Um, just to quickly flag, we have one more question, but if somebody's put something in the chat and they'd like it to be answered, it needs to go in the Q&A so that we can see it, because that's the one I have open. Um, but the second question uh, speaks very much to sustainability. Um, they're asking about the fact that materials that are taken from the environment for these production, um, is there a move to replenish the raw materials is replenishment of raw materials an issue? Um, I think with some products that it's quite different from others, I'm aware uh, for our own project. So um, could everybody speak to that slightly in terms of, is there an active maybe replanting or ensuring that there is a continuity of supply um, without exhausting the supply, which has always been an issue uh, whenever anything's taken from the natural environment? Thank you, Judith. Yes, please. I could jump in. I think one of the things before we start thinking in building large farms and we cover the whole island with it is almost this notion of proportionality, making as a community inside of how much do we think we might make or produce and how much do we need and looking also having this knowledge of the plants, how quick do they reestablish, how much do we harvest. Normally there's a rule, you take like 30%, so the plant still thrives and there's lots of kind of uh, harvesting techniques that can be used. So I think in the development of a market, it's very good to have an ecologist there who really can help establishing uh, 
what is a good way uh, when people now say yeah, it's not so safe to go into the forest i have to go there well maybe we can plant five trees here and we replant in a cycles in two years another five trees so it's almost thinking in this kind of nature cyclus that is very different than our market cyclus that is on demand so it, it is a, always a, a kind of friction but i think thinking about proportionality about how much do we actually need or what is it gives a bit of insight of uh, that a village doesn't have to suddenly boom into a, 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 like a shaving the whole hill down uh, to make a, a farm. And, um, and often we don't really think about it and just start planting, but not thinking about the consequences. And uh, that would be my input. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, does anyone else have any specific case studies or uh, comments? Please, Jeff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for Tina, uh, since it's considered as an uh, indigenous community, so uh, it's also protected by the ancestral domain. So uh, the protection and su sustainable sourcing of their uh, non-timber forest products are already ingrained in the culture. Now, moving forward, if the demand for their products would increase, I think um, uh, there are uh, certain policies that which, are, which are already uh, in place such as, for example, here in Palawan, uh, there is what you call the uh, environmentally critical area network of which uh, the Tina ancestral domain is part of. There is a core zone, which means that you cannot touch the area. And there are also buffer zone wherein you can put plantation areas for specific kind of um, uh, non-timber forest products. So I think the, the, um, the policies are already in place around and what the community needs is actually demand for their products. And I think that's what we are trying to do here. That's my input. Thanks very much. Um, I'm aware that we've, we are running over time. So uh, what I'd like to do is thank all the panelists for answering those, those two questions. That's very interesting. Uh, and for your presentations that you've given today, which have really been a wonderful introduction to different parts of the Philippines and also about sustainability and practice. So thank you to everybody. And if I'll pass back to Kaina. Thank you for facilitating the discussion, Peter. And what an amazing one that was. There were many ways to sustain the handshake between traditional and transformative, and the presentations make great case studies and recommendations for moving forward. Speaking of moving forward, let's pause for a quick poll to gather your feedback on how we can improve the next session. We'll be together for three more days, and we'll be flashing the questions on screen, so please take a moment to answer them. First, how are you feeling after the presentations? Are you excited to begin or apply something to try another angle with what you're already doing? Are you happy? Do you feel validated, relieved, and hopeful about what you're hearing? Do you feel neutral? This is just information. You're going to process it later. Or are you a bit confused? Is it um, clashing with data that you already know? Do you want to do something but don't know how to go about it? Do you answer in the poll that is being flashed on screen. We have for now equal parts excited and happy. And this is actually a very positive thing. I am glad that after listening to all of these case studies, everyone sort of wants to apply what the present presenters have been doing into their own communities. That is so relieving to hear. All right, so poll three, let's start with poll three. Um, my knowledge, that is your knowledge of sustainability and forest management has improved through the webinar. Do you strongly agree? Do you agree? Are you a little undecided? Um, do you disagree? You already know all of this. Do you strongly disagree? All right. Okay. Overwhelmingly agree, which is wonderful. And I feel that you also have a lot of burning questions that um, 
us running out of time might not be able to, you know, to field, but feel free to contact us and to send your questions over via chat. All right. Thank you for your feedback. This ends our first session. What I personally enjoyed are the inspiring stories from our hard to reach indigenous communities. You've heard their voices. Um, and I think as translation has been uploaded to the chat. So do check that out for people on mobile, contact our staff. We will be very happy to send you a link that can be read on mobile. This platform allows their voices to be heard. So, be sure to join us every day, especially on the last day, September 2nd, as we launch a virtual exhibit entitled From Land to Loom, From Fiber to Form, Woven Networks Research Projects, with proof of concepts of what we've heard today and what we'll hear in the next few days. This is just the first one. A few reminders. If you have any inquiries, whatever, please send us an email at maryann.palacio at britishcouncil.org.ph. The email is flashed on screen, so do take note of that or screen grab it if you will. We will also be sharing session recordings and other resources on the Woven Networks website, so be sure to follow the British Council social media accounts at PHBritish on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. It's right there on your screen. And use the hashtags Woven Networks, Crafting Futures, and Let's Grow Together if you want to post about this event. Once again, this is Kay. Thank you for joining us today.